today I'm going to show you everything wrong with Jessica O'Reilly's TEDx talk on YouTube, Monogamish, The New Rules of Marriage. Jessica's video about how to open up your monogamous relationship has garnered almost 4 million views on YouTube, and no wonder. Alternatives to traditional monogamy are popping up all over the place. But do these alternatives really work for couples? You're going to find out what works and what doesn't work so you don't end up making major mistakes that you later regret. We're going to break down the major ideas in Jessica's talk and give you a science-based understanding of whether or not they really hold any water. Hi, it's Gabrielle, and for over 12 years I've been a licensed professional counselor and relationship expert in private practice in Boulder, Colorado, and my practice is grounded in the science of what makes relationships work. And if you're enjoying what you learn in these videos, please subscribe to my YouTube channel right now. Just click on the subscribe button right here. And please go to my website, thepowercoupleformula.com, for lots more information about how to build an amazing relationship, and powercoupleseducation.com to stay connected. Okay, let's dive into monogamish. Jessica's talk is about the term monogamish, coined by sex advice columnist Dan Savage. Monogamish refers to a way of being in intimate relationship that is somewhere between polyamorous and being exclusively committed to one partner. Savage and O'Reilly both advance the idea that there are many gradations in between these two extremes, and that most people are naturally drawn to live their lives somewhere in the middle of the two. Listen to Jessica's rationale for wanting to change the rules of marriage. Take a look. And if a superbug is unresponsive to a current vaccination, we go back to the lab to develop a new formulation. When something doesn't work, when anything doesn't work, we innovate. So why do we accept the monogamous marriage in its current form despite its design flaws? Jessica's theory is that couples should modify their monogamous relationships to better reflect the fact that most people do not fit squarely into a monogamous context. Her reasoning is that marriage is currently in crisis. She suggests that just like if a superbug is unresponsive to a current vaccination, we go back to the lab to develop a new formulation, she says, when something doesn't work, we innovate. But be that as it may, she says that we should not accept marriage with its current design flaw. The design flaw she's implying is that people are attracted to other people besides the person that they're with. And traditional marriage doesn't allow them to act on these impulses. So she attributes the problem to a design flaw in marriage as an institution. But her analogy doesn't really hold up. It's like saying, I drove my Tesla into a telephone pole and blaming the accident on a design flaw in your Tesla. Let's take a look at how we're steering our marriages. A lot of people are dissatisfied in their marriages and they think it's because they're no longer attracted to each other and they don't have good sex. They think the grass is always greener on the other side. But what they don't realize is that the feelings that couples experience in the beginning of a new relationship, those hot, lusty feelings, naturally wane over time. The dopamine starts to decrease after the first six months to two years of a new relationship. For many people, they feel pulled to get on Tinder and look for that next relationship, but they don't really want to end their current relationship. For people who might be pulled in this direction, thinking it, be, it could be a solution to the lack of sexual excitement they now feel with their partner, understand that there are some serious pitfalls that we really need to consider here. In fact, these pitfalls are such a big deal that I take a lot of time in my new book, The Power Couple Formula, to discuss them. The addiction to dopamine and the impact that it has on the ability of, of the couple to form a long-term committed intimate relationship is a serious matter. Couples need to build the emotional connection between them if they're going to continue to feel attracted to each other in the long term. This means tending to the relationship every day. Many couples get caught up in the hustle and bustle of life. They stop doing the things that created the good times that brought them together in the first place. This isn't to say that some of what Jessica is saying in monogamish couldn't work for some. 
But understand that according to Jessica herself, only four to five percent of people who have ever tried open relationships actually felt they succeeded. With these one in 20 odds, you really ought to pay attention to the potential pitfalls of this approach. Now let's hear what Jessica has to say about sharing one's partner. The problem with open relationships is that most of us just don't want one. We're okay with other people being open, but we don't want to share our partners happily ever after with one true soulmate has been too firmly ingrained in our subconsciousness since birth. As Jessica says, most people don't want to share their partners. She cites that the reason for this is that, quote, happily ever after has been too ingrained in us since birth. Jessica presents the reason that people don't want to share as resulting from the fact that we've been fed a princess fairy story that we just don't want to let go of. What she doesn't appreciate is that human beings, just like all mammals, are fundamentally wired for what we term monotropy. This means that we develop a strong bond with one preferred caregiver. This happens with young infants, but it doesn't stop there. The need for a primary attachment object continues throughout the lifespan. This is a question of biological hardwiring and not Disney fantasy land. Her theory is that most people will neither want to be truly polyamorous nor truly monogamous. So they're better suited for monogamish somewhere in between. Let's see what she says here. Let's use monogamish to take the monotony out of monogamy in a way that preserves the sanctity, the safety, and the comfort of our relationships. So monogamish, what might this look like? Well, Jessica says that she's trying to fine tune the philosophy of monogamish. She wants to preserve the sanctity, safety, and comfort of our intimate relationships while bringing back their racy, lusty excitement. So she proposes four levels of monogamish, progressing from what she claims is the closest to monogamous to the most open relationship. But her theory goes further and further away from any understanding of what we know about how humans bond. Let's take a look at the first level. Monogamish couples might look to extramarital sources for sexual stimulation, but only in thought not in action. So if Jessica proposes that the first level of monogamish is thinking about someone you see who you're attracted to. But I propose this, simply being attracted to someone besides your partner and thinking about that person does not under any circumstances make you non-monogamous. It's perfectly normal and natural for people in committed relationships to feel sexual attraction to other people. The issue that creates problems in long-term committed intimate relationships isn't those natural feelings of attraction for other people besides your partner, but the secrecy that many partners feel around their own feelings of attraction. When partners harbor secret sexual thoughts or secret thoughts about anything for that matter, it's a reflection of insecurity in the relationship. It means that the couple does not feel that they can share all parts of themselves with each other. In fact, later in her video, Jessica states that it could take partners, quote, years to work their way up to divulging their deepest, darkest fantasies, unquote. This withholding of information is going to be a problem for the safety and security system of the couple's relationship. It doesn't even matter if it's about sex or anything else. When people feel that they need to hide parts of themselves, even if those parts might be hurtful to their partner, it will slowly erode the relationship. The partner in hiding will never feel that they can truly be themselves, and this is going to drive them further and further out of the relationship. They will never feel that they can be free to be themselves without shame. This lack of freedom and honesty erodes the trust because secrecy only breeds more secrecy. Feeling free to share the deepest parts of yourself is part of creating a satisfying, enduring, and emotionally intimate relationship. Now here's where Jessica gets even further away from the reality of human nature. 
in her levels two and three of her monogamish. Jessica's level two of monogamish is what she calls talk but no touch. Talk but not touch. So monogamish couples might look to extramarital sources for sexual arousal and pleasure in a talk format with no touch. Flirting with other people comes to, a, comes to mind as a really good example of this. She gives the example of you and your husband going out for dinner and you encouraging him to flirt with the waitress. She's really cute, isn't she? She's checking you out, you would say to your husband. And with your coaxing, maybe he flirts with the waitress. The two of you go home and you fantasize together about this waitress and that makes you both really sexually excited to have another person involved on the fantasy level in your sex life. Then Jessica talks about level three, where couples go into action. And then we have couples who make this foray into monogamous territory and they love it. They relish in it. And they say, you know what? Things have never been better. Let's take it to another level. Those couples might decide, let's go to a strip club. Let's get a couple of lap dances. A few years later, maybe they work their way into the back room. They go to a strip club, lap dances, chat rooms, or they know someone who's a swinger and they'd like the idea of that environment, even if they don't actually want to swing. But here's the question, the question that I hope you'll ask yourself, did the couple actually agree to this? The real problem couples get into with monogamish is that they don't talk about their true feelings. Very often one partner agrees to some non-monogamous sexual activity because they know the other partner wants it and they're afraid that if they don't agree, they'll become less desirable to their partner and may even lose the relationship so they don't stand up for their feelings and needs and they suffer for it. If both partners really are interested in engaging other partners in their sex lives and they don't feel that they're sacrificing who they are and what they want, the second mistake they make is not fully hashing out the rules of the game. Just like with many aspects of a couple's life, Partners often have implicit expectations in their minds about how they expect to be treated by their partner. And when this doesn't happen, they get angry and feel betrayed. The fact is they never even talked about their expectations of each other in the first place. Couples need to have conversations about everything if they want to try and open up their relationship. This includes a plan for safer sex, birth control, how to stay in contact with each other throughout the experience, how to signal each other in the moment if one of them isn't feeling good about it, how to vet a potential third partner, what each partner feels comfortable doing with a third partner, and what they feel comfortable with their partner doing or not. These conversations must include the right to change one's mind at any time. The bottom line is that the emotional safety and security of the couple must come first. If either partner feels that one of the other sexual or romantic partners takes precedence or poses a threat to either one of the primary partners or their relationship, that isn't going to work. Jessica then talks about her solution to couples dealing with the jealousy that arises when they begin to interact sexually and romantically with other partners. Take a look. But every couple deals with these jealousies, these insecurities, these challenges in their very own way. Some take baby steps. They don't dive in to monogamish. They do it a little bit at a time. They might start by simply admitting to which celebrities they find attractive, right? It could take them years to work their way up to actually divulging their deepest, darkest fantasies. But these years, that process is what makes it hot. Her solution to jealousy is for couples to take what she calls baby steps. The implicit message here is that couples should work up to being able to tolerate the jealousy inducing behavior of the other partner. So presumably you should just practice tolerating a small amount of jealousy as you watch your husband receive a lap dance from another female in preparation for tolerating more and more jealousy. 
From an evolutionary perspective, men are biologically hardwired to prevent their mates from becoming pregnant with another man's child. And women are hardwired to be concerned that a man's heart will not drift to other commitments and preoccupations that would prevent them from investing together with them in the very labor intensive task of raising a child. It's not like I feel strongly about not wearing white after Labor Day, but I'll try to transcend that. This is serious business. If you feel threatened by your partner's sexual or romantic behaviors with other people, you need to tell them to stop and they should be stopping of their own volition because they care about you. If they won't stop, it's time for you to end your relationship. Power couples understand that monogamish is playing with fire. You and your partner are dealing with the deep instinctual parts of your brains. And if you don't stop to contend with the safety and security needs of those parts, you're going to get into a lot of trouble. If you're going to swim in the waters of monogamish, you need total agreement from both partners with absolutely no compromising and crystal clear rules of the game that put your relationship with each other first. Okay, now let's hear from you. What are your bottom lines when it comes to monogamish? Is this a no-fly zone for you? Or are you itching to get started? And if so, what steps do you need to take today if you're in a primary relationship to protect your primary relationship? Leave me your comments below. I look forward to hearing them and seeing you in the next video.